We've been very busy here, a uh, piece of, uh, what should I say, scholarship, erudition, history, and it's very reasonable. I mean, there's nothing uh, in it that, uh, uh, you know, might be seen as playing to any kind of gallery, any kind of ideological gallery. So, uh, you know, really congratulations on that stupendous achievement, 700 pages in which you've looked at uh, sources from all kinds of uh, archives, a lot of stuff in Marathi. I know your mom was Marathi, so Maharashtrian. So, uh, you know, because reading all that material in these various languages. So, first of all, once again, congratulations for that uh, best-selling volume. But I'll come, I'll come back to you, Vikram, just to introduce you properly. But I just wanted to say, uh, uh, you know, that, uh, uh, you know, by way of uh, welcoming you to our distinguished lecture series, I wanted to uh, also, uh, welcome our fellows who have joined us. Uh, and uh, I wanted to actually link up your presentation to one we had on uh, Thursday. Friday was Eid, it was a holiday, which was on Gandhi, you see, by Professor Chehel. And it's interesting how, I mean, IIS is still one of those places where, uh, can you hear me at all? Or are you? Okay, good. Uh, okay, okay, good. I, I, I was saying that IIS is still one of those places where you can talk of Gandhi on a Thursday or Friday and then break for the weekend. And Monday, you can come back and talk about Savarkar, you know. So I think this is a part of our mandate uh, as uh, conceived by uh, uh, Dr. Sarvapali Radhakrishnan, our founder, who wanted all kinds of ideas uh, to be discussed and openly, uh, you know, inquired into at IIAS. And also in a manner which was not superficial or polemical but go to, uh, you know, problems and challenges that confront humanity itself since the Institute was founded just after the Indo-Pak War of 65 and when the world was in the middle of a raging Cold War as well. But uh, I, I just thought, you know, to link up these two great figures, Gandhi and Savarkar, we saw on Thursday how you see, Gandhi has also been viewed from two completely opposite lenses in the recent past, you know, uh, because we've had this take down Gandhi movement. Anti culture also becomes uh, anti Gandhi. Uh, and uh, from being a Mahatma, now he's being seen as, as the collaborator of the British, the cause of the partition, a child molester, racist, what not, you know. So the pendulum, in a way, has swung to the other extreme as far as uh, the manner in which Gandhi has been understood and represented in the national discourse is concerned. And obviously, uh, there is a need, uh, uh, you know, for intermedial hermeneutics, a way to go between these two polarities. And I guess the same is true of Savarkar, who has been demonized and reviled for such a long time. And I think yours is a corrective biography, which uh, tries to sort of uh, balance uh, you know, this extreme, uh, and I would say politically motivated, uh, uh, you know, uh, witch hunt, a hatchet job against Savarkar, to try to also show him in his time as a person who was revolutionary uh, at a particular time, uh, at the height of British imperialism, a very brave man who personally risked his life on a number of occasions. I'll come to that in a moment when I actually see zero in on a very fascinating part of your book. But I think you you uh, you give us a Savarkar who is balanced, who is a very modern person, anti-caste, a reformer, as well as a revolutionary, uh, you know, who, for example, uh, you know, said some things about uh, cow slaughter, you know, which would not sit very well with, uh, you know, a very rabid kind of... Uh, 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 you know, right of center Hindutva group as well, because Savarkar was by and large a rationalist. And you also show how he began with a kind of Hindu Muslim unity in his first uh, War of Independence book. And then, you know, by the time he wrote Hindutva, you know, about, uh, you know, you might say 12 years later, 13 years later, 14 years later, I think he had changed because so much had happened in between, you know, that made him really doubt whether. There was a possibility of creating a nation uh, on the basis that 
Gandhi and others were trying. So I think you show all of that really well. You document as a, as a literateur, as, you know, as a poet, as a very sensitive letter writer. So it's a great work. Once again, my heartiest congratulations. But I just want to go, go back to that very crucial moment in history, 1909, when both Gandhi and Savarkar coincided in Delhi. And you know, Madanlal Dhingra uh, killed, uh, 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 you know, uh, uh, Wiley Curzon, and, or Curzon Wiley, sorry, Curzon Wiley. And then he, Cousin Wiley, and uh, who was his father's friend? And Dingra was was training to be an engineer, and uh, uh, he actually wanted to kill somebody else, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. All of that is partly in your book, but the point is he was tried very swiftly and sent to the gallows within a matter of a couple of months. And uh, the finger of suspicion is it, uh, uh, you know, at least when it came to who instigated him, was. Of course, Vinayak Damodar Savarkar. Gandhi was there at that time in Delhi. And uh, the reason I bring this up is because 1909 is the year when two seminal, seminal books were written, both banned by the British. The first Indian War of Independence by Savarkar, who sat in the British Library and wrote a revisionist history of the so-called Great Mutiny. And uh, Gandhi, who wrote Hind Swaraj, on the ship SS Kildonan Castle, sailing from Southampton to South Africa. And you tell us how nice, how nicely you tell us that Savarkar's book was smuggled, uh, you know, in wrappings of Pickwick papers and, uh, you know, uh, Tale of Two Cities and such books, such other books. Don Quixote, uh, you know, the yeah. cover was Don Quixote and the book was First Indian War of Independence. And then, you know, this very crucial point in your book, which, which totally fascinates me, and perhaps you can tell us a little bit about that. When uh, I'm, I'm now talking about 1910, when in January, if I'm not mistaken, January 5th, Savarkar uh, sails uh, for, uh, he, he crosses the channel, he takes a train to Calais, and he crosses the channel and goes to Paris, right? Uh, and then, and then the British, in the meanwhile, have mounted uh, this, uh, you know, investigation against him. The CID from India has sent very incriminating documents to England, and the Scotland Yard and the inspectors are looking for him. And for some peculiar reason, in March, uh, I think, I think on the fifteenth uh, or seventeenth of March, I've got a note here somewhere, but I won't go into it. I won't waste time going into it in March, for some reason, Savarkar returns to England and is immediately arrested. He's with Radha Nauroji's granddaughter. Imagine the grand old man of the Congress Party is helping the revolutionaries in Paris, which include uh, Madame Bhikaji Kama, Shamji Krishna Varma is already in Paris, Virendrana Chattopadhyay, Chatto, uh, a younger brother of Sarojini Nai was then killed in the Stalinist purges. When I went to St. Petersburg, I saw a plaque for him there. But all these people are in Paris, and Dada Bhai Nauroji's granddaughter accompanies Savarkar uh, in this train, which pulls into Waterloo. And as soon as he comes to Waterloo, he's arrested, he's tried. And that's when his uh, deporting to India begins. He's sent to the Andamans. Of course, he tries to escape from the porthole of the ship in, in Marseille. And all the socialists and the communists and the revolutionaries in Paris try to help him. So it's a very interesting conjuncture in Indian history that you talk about. And it's always interested me, why did Savarkar return to London when he knew that it would have meant, if not the gallows, then life transportation, then Kalapani, you know? And so this, these are the fascinating things your book throws up. Two biographies of Savarkar came out. Yours, of course, the more detailed uh, and then another one by Vaibhav Purandare, which I also enjoyed reading. So Savarkar is ripe for re-examination. And uh, we look to you to tell us how and why you embarked upon this and what your challenges were and, uh, and what your uh, highlights of your, uh, you know, uh, should I say, uh, your, your uh, magnificent accomplishment kept you going. And uh, of course, something about the second volume. I know that you were interested in documents relating to the trial of Nathuram Ghodse because it came to the Punjab High Court to Shimla. Yes. The trial was right yes. 
next to IIAS in Peterhof. Uh, and I think except for Godse, who didn't apply, uh, didn't apply for an appeal, everybody else appealed, including Savarkar. Uh, but we don't have those papers. Maybe they're in the National Archives. So Shukla has a connection with both Savarkar and with Gandhi, because it's only when the trial uh, appeal was turned down that Godse and Apte were sentenced to death by hanging. They were hung in Ambala, if I'm not mistaken. And the ashes were interred in the Gagga. So no, there would be no memorial. Kisi ko koi khabar nahi padti, you know. And these, uh, these Godseites who want to erect temples for him, you know. Imagine what would have happened if there had been a Samadhi somewhere. Anyhow, so uh, this is a very fascinating topic. We are deeply interested in it in Shimla at IIS. Uh, we've had a deep connection with Gandhiji, who's, who's come here several times. Uh, and we, we, I will just turn it over to you, Vikramji, but just a moment to introduce you. Uh, Vikramji and I have a link. We were both students of the Bishop Cotton Boys School in Bangalore, okay, which we did not discover till very much later, because he was my junior by many, many years. But I tell you, somebody asked me uh, some time ago, I think the print was doing an article on the most promising younger intellectuals of India. So they asked the suspects for the so-called left-wing intellectuals. And they asked me uh, to name the so-called right-wing intellectuals, you know. So on the top of my list was uh, uh, Vikramji. So I named two or three. Uh, I, I won't tell you the three I named, but Vikramji was certainly in that list. And I admire him immensely. I've read his books. He's got a wonderful book on Gaur Jan. And I'm going to end with a quotation from that book in a moment, if I can find it. But his first book was on the Mysore uh, Maharajas, the splendors of the royal Mysore of the royal of royal Mysore, the untold story of the Wadiyars. And I think looking at the Mysore archives, he came across this amazing character, Gohrjan, whose music I had heard in uh, uh, 78 RPM records, you know, long ago. The short three-minute clips, you know, along with greats like Abdul uh, Khan Sahab, Abdul Karim Khan, and others. I must tell you, Vikramji is a trained vocalist. Okay, he's a man of many parts. He's an aesthete, he's a historian. He's got a PhD from the University of Queensland. He's an immensely, he's also got an MBA, if I'm not mistaken. Am I right, yes. Vikramji? Yes. yes. From SP Jain, yes. right? SP Jain, that's right. So, that's right. Uh, uh, did you go to that that one at the Bharatiya Vidya Bhavan campus or yes. the other one? Yes. The Bharatiya Vidya Bhavan campus. So it's a top yes. rated, it's, a, it's I think in the top five or seven of our Indian MBAs. So I greatly admire Vikramji. He's a soft-spoken, gentle person. I've never seen him raise his voice. He, I've been with him on several panels in GLF and uh, uh, in other such literary festivals. He always argues with facts. Uh, and uh, so now I'll turn it over to you, uh, Vikramji. Thank you for joining us. Uh, let me just read if I can find my e-copy of Gohar Jan. Sure. Uh, you know, I, I want sure. to... I want to start with this epigraph, okay, where, uh, uh, you know, the epigraph is, is, is from uh, uh, Badi Mahajan, you know, she writes uh, this, uh, this little thing, uh, uh, you know, about, you know, in those times, you know, so we are all in the eyes of God, of course, we are all sinners. So she writes, Bakshega har guna wo isaya sha ar ka, behad hai rahem bandhon pe parvardigar ka. So, asking for uh, uh, sins, uh, the forgiveness of sins of habitual offenders, you know, such as ourselves, who are also writers. Let me now uh, <laughs> turn it over, turn, turn it over to, to Vikramji uh, to tell us about his wonderful adventures in writing this book on Savarkar. By the way, the title of this book, Echoes of a Forgotten Past, you know, it's a very beautiful literary title also. So over to you, Vikramji. Dr. Vikram Sampat. Thank you. Thank you so much, Makranji. I think, uh, I don't think I've ever been introduced so so well and so uh, with so much of warmth and affection as only you could. And thank you so much. 
uh, for that. I know you'd been inviting me several uh, on several occasions to the IIAS in person, and I wish I had grabbed that opportunity much earlier before the lockdown so that we could have had this discussion in person rather than uh, in this virtual medium. But I'm sure uh, that day too shall come very soon. Uh, I was indeed very, very, uh, you know, fascinated by when I think someone from your staff, uh, I asked her, like, what is the title that you'd want me to talk about and uh, she tossed this uh, title at me and I, I'm sure it's come from you of the challenges that one faces <laughs> when writing on someone like Vinayak Damodar Savarkar and I immediately said okay that's a that's a wonderful topic for discussion with such a erudite group of scholars who have all assembled here such eminent fellows um, and a very good afternoon and uh, thank you for joining to everybody. Uh, before getting into the details of, I think, Savarkar, I think um, it's it's probably pertinent to dwell a little about the whole art of, and craft of biography writing itself, uh, you know, and I take you back to that uh, 1931 essay that Virginia Woolf had written on the art of biography writing, where she calls uh, biographies as the most restricted of all arts, and a biographer is I think it's uh, unlike a novelist he is an artist under oath because uh, he or she cannot make up facts and there is this uh, harsh need to actually authenticate facts but what exactly do these facts constitute uh, do does it only mean the documentation which would constitute just the outer shell the public life of the individual or is there a deeper inner kernel the inner life of an individual which makes it a complete biography a complete account but the conundrum there is also, uh, you know, the, the kind of an existential crisis, so to say, for a biographer is can we reach that inner core at all of anybody uh, in our own lives? Uh, is there something called a complete life? If we sit back to write the story of our own lives, uh, will we be ever truthful? Uh, as Emily Dickinson had said, Abyss has no biographer. Uh, so the, the lowest points of our lives, we usually probably uh, try to cover it up or don't make it public. So within all these constraints and conjectures and dots that one needs to connect, uh, I think a bio biographer operates with those challenges. And these are the larger challenges that any biographer would face. And I actually uh, dwelling on, on what uh, um, Virginia Woolf had said, I'm just uh, uh, reading a little bit of that essay where she said, uh, you know, uh, if one needs to write a biography of a Mr. Jones, uh, you'll have to get in touch with uh, his widow, uh, Mrs. Jones, to get all his letters and private documents. And she says, uh, you know, the widow and the friends were hard taskmasters. Suppose, for example, that this man of genius was immoral, ill-tempered, and threw the boots at the maid's head. The widow would say, oh, but I still loved him. He was the father of my children. And public who love his books must on no account be disillusioned. So cover up, omit. And so the biographer obeyed. And so almost, you know, the majority of the Victorian biographies of those times were literally like those wax figures which are preserved in Westminster Abbey, which were carried in funeral processions through the streets, uh, effigies that have only a very smooth, superficial likeness to the body in the coffin. Uh, but then she says, Virginia Woolf again says, but slowly, uh, and I quote, uh, widows became broader minded, the public keener sighted, the effigy no longer carried conviction or satisfied curiosity. The biographer certainly won a measure of freedom. At least he could hint that there were scars and furrows on the dead man's face, unquote. So I think this has been uh, a, a challenge that uh, people who dwell into their lives almost with a kind of a voyeuristic pleasure of looking into the, uh, not only from the ringside, but also from the inside of another individual's life and times uh, and every little detail of that person. Uh, these are particular challenges one faces, but the, I think the challenges get more accentuated when one deals with a figure as uh, Makranji mentioned, as contentious and also as uh, controversial, reviled, misunderstood, maligned as a Vinayak Damodar Savarkar. And those challenges that I, uh, you know, faced were a plenty. Uh, and I'll talk about those and also paint a little picture of, uh, you know, his life and times, the many aspects and facets of, uh, you know, his very multifaceted life and stormy life. And then maybe we could open up for questions on particular details of these different aspects. 
Now, the uh, it was way back when he was still, he just come out of jail, uh, and it was in 1926, uh, if I'm not mistaken, that there was this very slim English biography of his, which continues to raise a lot of heckles uh, today. Uh, it was written in a pseudonym by the name of Chitra Gupta, uh, very, uh, you know, uh, coincidentally, somebody who was the account keeper of uh, Lord Yama, the god of death. So Chitra Gupta wrote this uh, slim biography called The Life of Barrister Savarkar. And it was, it was uh, hardly it was a life because it was in 1926, he had just come out of jail. So it was more the story of Savarkar, the revolutionary Savarkar uh, and his time in uh, the Kalapani in the Andamans uh, and all of that. And so that continues today and why it raises heckles, as I mentioned, was the fact that uh, some people say it was Savarkar himself who wrote this eulogizing uh, account of himself, uh, whereas the jury is out in the open, some also opine that it was perhaps uh, one of his secret admirers, uh, quite unlikely, uh, uh, unlikely of the secret admirers, see Rajagopalachari, who wrote this uh, uh, book on him, while some others say it's his uh, erstwhile revolutionary comrade, uh, VVS Iyer, who was then uh, in back in India, who wrote this biography. And because the book was published from Madras uh, and not from Bombay presidency where Savarkar was housed. So that was the first time I think people really got to know who this uh, man really was. Later on in the 1940s, uh, you had a few uh, Marathi uh, books that came out on him including one uh, by uh, Karandikar, uh, Shivram Pant Karandikar, uh, who wrote a very detailed, almost 600-page biography with lots of mem uh, you know, memoirs and uh, documents and so on. Uh, this was uh, around 1943-44. Uh, but soon after, with uh, Savarkar's implication in the Gandhi murder uh, case, uh, so reviled uh, did the man become and such a political and social pariah that anybody or anything associated with him had to be kept at such a long arm's uh, length that Karandikar found it extremely difficult to even uh, sell copies of this book. Uh, so much so that it said that he wanted to burn all uh, the remaining copies because he didn't have a place to uh, you know, even maintain the inventory. And that is when the very famous uh, Marathi writer and biographer uh, Baba Sahab Purandre, uh, you know, he uh, kind of... Uh, volunteered to actually go door to door canvassing and selling this book for Karandikar. Now, Savarkar himself was a prolific writer, someone who wrote several thousands and thousands of pages of uh, uh, literature on various aspects, including on his own life. Uh, and most of his early life has been documented by him, but somewhere that trails away. And uh, I think the, 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 uh, you know, the, busyness of his life, particularly after he got into politics, ensured that he did not get so much time to uh, pen down a lot of what he uh, did in life. But then his secretary, Bala Rao Savarkar, uh, very assiduously noted down all of this. And right from his time when he was in, uh, in house arrest in Ratnagiri for 13 years, uh, uh, he wrote this entire book called the Ratnagiri Parva in Marathi. Then uh, you had two other volumes, which was the Hindu Mahasabha Parva of his uh, years as the president of the All India Hindu Mahasabha uh, from 1937 to about 1944. And then the whole uh, run up to partition and uh, you know how the Hindu Mahasabha being the only uh, force and political body in India, which opposed partition till the last and opposed Jinnah as well uh, in the uh, Akhanda Hindustan Ladha Parva. So these are small, small fragments that came around, uh, which uh, which kind of uh, put together pieces, so to say, of the puzzle of what Savarkar's life was. But still, the larger picture was re never really known, unlike probably several of his contemporaries, like a Gandhi who, uh, you know, maintained uh, his own writings, and these were translated regularly in from Gujarati and into English and so on. But Savarkar wrote largely in Marathi, and these two. Only till recently, they were only uh, translated into Hindi, but they were all compiled into a voluminous 10 volume Savarkar Savagra uh, Vangmai, which uh, uh, largely, you know, leaving the confines of Maharashtra and Maharashtrians who knew about him, I think that the rest of the country, he was still this enigmatic figure who meant many things to many people at the same time. Uh, it was much later, only in uh, the 1960s, a few uh, years before he died in 1966, that uh, one of his associates, Dhananjay Keir, uh, went on to write uh, with Savarkar's uh, active involvement in the project, uh, with through interviews and documents and all of that, uh, a compiled biography 
of his entire life from 19 uh, from 1883 when he was born in Bhagur uh, till the time he was alive and then that was updated after he died now 1967 68 perhaps was when this book comes out and we are we were in 2019 when uh, my biography came out uh, of his uh, in this interim uh, i find it extremely amazing that uh, a person who intrudes modern contemporary political discourse uh, almost on a regular basis and probably even as we speak there's some controversy brewing somewhere someone in some election rally and now is the time of elections again and so in every election uh, uh, his name gets invoked there are very few characters of the past who intrude our contemporary discourse in the way that Savarkar does where both his proponents as well as opponents uh, use his name his legacy to uh, you know target uh, their political opponents and when I looked back at the whole corpus of uh, literature, uh, saying what is it that, that is extant about Savarkar that one can actually uh, look back and see whether to either uh, you know, eulogize him or to demonize him, uh, the, the shockingness of the whole thing was uh, something that, that hit me hard, that there is, uh, after Dhananjay Kheer's uh, work, nobody, no historian in India had actually managed to uh, attempt a revision, a re-evaluation of this man and his legacy. And neither did those who actually were his proponents take any effort to uh, to kind of understand him because understanding him also meant a lot of hard work of having to read those several thousands and thousands of pages that he wrote in very klisht Marathi, which is very difficult to understand. Uh, and so to it, uh, so you, it was largely a, a lot of uh, you know um, uh, rhetoric and so on that went on both sides of the spectrum. And for a young man or woman in India today, if they want to really understand what is all this hullabaloo about this man who died way back in 1966 and why does his name get invoked as a British stooge, a traitor, a collaborator of the British, a murderer of Gandhi, and on the one side, on the other side, somebody who was a social reformer, a revolutionary, uh, the uh, ideologue of Hindutva and all of this, uh, there's very little to fall back on. But it's not as if uh, there is no uh, raw material, there is no data, uh, as I was to discover in the three to four years that uh, I've already spent on this and the, when the topic comes challenges in writing his biography, I think it's in present continuous tense because it's still not over, considering the volume two, uh, which is more difficult to deal with, is still underway. So the, the the data that is there about him is literally screaming, and uh, you know from from vaults in archives and uh, libraries across uh, India and also outside India to be heard, to be read. And many often when I see the accession number of the uh, the microfilms or the books, it's never even been touched by anybody. And that is the sadness of the uh, you know uh, the academic uh, you know ingenuity or disingenuity, if I may say, that we. We like to revile or uh, eulogize someone without making a study of that person. So uh, in the Nehru Memorial Museum and Library, where I've been a senior fellow, uh, we've had the entire corpus of uh, Savarkar private papers uh, accounting to 26 microfilm roles uh, right from 1924 till the end of his life because every letter that went in and out of his house was intercepted uh, both by the British government and by Nehru's government. Uh, so the only person who was probably under surveillance by both the foreign as well as an independent Indian government, all of this has been uh, digitized and put there, but again, not accessed. Uh, similarly, outside India, in uh, the British Library, uh, uh, London, and in the National Archives of UK, in the archives in France, in Germany, that I spent significant amount of time, there too, you know, the five stormy years that he spent there and through that also the story of the uh, pan uh, you know uh, pan national international intercontinental uh, struggle uh, for indian liberation that happened uh, especially between the two uh, world wars all that story also sits there unheard un unread and un uh, you know uh, consulted by anybody from india uh, largely and so that's another travesty with the way our history itself has been documented particularly uh, of uh, the the annals of our freedom struggle and the multiple narratives that exist uh, within that freedom struggle itself. Now, Savarkar uh, himself, you know, uh, uh, as I said, he wrote extensively, and in one of his in the very first preface of his Savarkar Samagra Vangmai, uh, I think he holds out a piece of advice for uh, a potential biographer, uh, someone like me who would write about him 60, 70 years after he is dead. And he says this, and I 
quote from him. While it is nice to describe a beautiful rose in full bloom, it would be incomplete without a description of everything, right from its roots, the stem, the manure, and the nutrients that have sustained it, the fresh and the dried leaves, as also the thorns, in order to conceptualize the beauty of that rose in all its dimensions. Likewise, for a human being's biography, he needs to be presented as is and not as should be, from head to toe, nothing more, nothing less, as transparent and as true to reality as one can be. Everything that can be said or unsaid that is embarrassing or praiseworthy has to be documented without inhibitions and without fears. Of course, given the social and political situation that I'm writing these in, despite my will, some of the details are being suppressed a little. Also, it would be a breach of trust to reveal confidential details of renowned people with whom I have had the good fortune of meeting and interacting with closely in my life. Still, I hold a promise that I have revealed all that needs to be revealed with the least of colors and the least of bias from my side." Unquote. So this was almost like, you know, uh, my protagonist telling me that, uh, you know, like Virginia Woolf's uh, uh, effigy, let there be scars and furrows on the face of the mummy and it need not be a picture perfect uh, biography, which is what most of our biographies, particularly political biographies, tend up becoming. So the idea was, first of all, to gather information about this man and also present him in this holistic picture where warts and all, everything, including his failings, which were numerous and which were natural if he were human, uh, are also presented uh, in as much detail. The problem uh, with Savarkar, as I mentioned, of uh, the fact that he's not been evaluated was for the longest period of time after independence and particularly after uh, his implication despite his acquittal in the Gandhi murder case, uh, was that he's, he'd become a persona non grata in uh, the Indian political discourse and social uh, discourse as well. And there are legendary tales of numerous lives and livelihoods that were lost and destroyed because they were even remotely associated with Savarkar. Uh, I think a, a, a shining example would be that of the most illustrious Hridayanath Mangeshkar. Uh, the whole Mangeshkar family uh, was very closely associated with Savarkar and Savarkar being a very uh, erudite poet had written so many different uh, poems in Marathi, uh, the famous Jayos Today uh, and the Sagara Prana Tadamalala that he wrote uh, from the seashore of Brighton, uh, you know, as an ode to the motherland. Most of these were tuned by Hridayanath and the uh, other Mangeshkar sisters. And most of them have recorded, Jayas Tute and Sagara have all been recorded by Lata Ji, Asha Ji and others. Uh, now, the very fact that Hridayanath Mangeshkar was associated with Savarkar ensured that he lost his job in the All India Radio uh, that he was associated with. So this is the uh, India, the intolerant India that uh, we've been uh, talking about now so much, where even uh, a person you may hate or you may uh, like, but the fact that you are not allowed to discuss about that person, that you're not even allowed to have an association with that person, and you need to pay a, a, a political, social, economic price for that, uh, I think that has been a travesty, that has been a casualty with even any attempt to uh, to reevaluate Savarkar, and that's why that's not happened. And luckily now, at least, you know, we are having this opportunity where Someone like a, like me or a Vaibha Purandare uh, that you mentioned, Makranji, can write a book on him and not uh, face the repercussions uh, and probably be packed off to jail or something. And we're having IIAs today sitting and uh, uh, discussing uh, someone like this, which probably would not have been possible a couple of decades ago. So uh, that itself, uh, when we talk of challenges of writing Savarkar's biography, this, uh, in addition to the usual challenges that biography itself faces, this man faces so many peculiar challenges, which are probably uh, unmatched in any other political figure uh, in, in, in Indian history, where you can't even talk about him. You cannot assess. You can, if you want to say bad things about him, of course, you are more than welcome. And that's what has been happening uh, in all these decades. But I must hasten to add that neither the, the, the biography nor this talk uh, is an apology for the person. Or uh, you know, I it, it's not uh, a, a case of advocacy or uh, you know correcting the so-called historical wrong. And I, I don't don all those uh, very ambitious mantles of wanting to correct historical wrongs to a great national hero and revisionism and so on. But uh, the fact, as I mentioned, is that when 
uh, the, the the data when the facts when the documents are uh, screaming their head off to be heard, I think it becomes a historian's burden to ensure that these come out in the open, in uh, the public, and it's then left to the discerning public, the readers, to make up their mind one way or the other as to which way their opinion swings. So with this rather long preface, uh, I think I'd uh, quickly uh, give um, an overview of the many aspects uh, and uh, facets of this, uh, this man's life. Starting with, of course, what Makaranji mentioned uh, of Savarkar, the revolutionary. Now, that too was something that, uh, you know, before I began this work, I knew nothing about. Uh, I knew nothing about Savarkar itself, uh, you know, to be honest, uh, having studied in uh, ISC syllabus, uh, Chip Cottons or late, earlier the CBSC, uh, you know, syllabus. I don't know how it is now, but those days, Savarkar or even many of the revolutionaries of Kalapani, they did not form part of my history textbook at all. So I knew thanks to my Maharashtrian, uh, half Maharashtrian lineage from my mother that there was this man who some part of uh, my maternal family uh, quite admired, but I didn't know much about him beyond a point. Uh, but uh, it was only in 2003 when uh, we had the whole fracas around his portrait being unveiled by Atalji's government in the Central Hall of Parliament. And later, of course, the whole uh, brohaha about Mani Shankar Iyer, uh, you know, throwing away the plaque that was put in his honor by uh, Mr. Ram Nayak at uh, Kalapani, uh, saying he was a traitor and so on. That, that's when, uh, you know, this man started, I think, coming right in the face of uh, modern Indian uh, political uh, debates. And the things have just gotten worse uh, since then. So even, so to, to, as I mentioned, Savarkar as a revolutionary was not something even I knew because normally we associate revolution with a Marxist lineage. Uh, but here was a man who was not uh, you know, inspired by Karl Marx or uh, Marxist uh, theory at all. But his, his idea of revolution was two pronged. One was a very indigenous uh, Indic kind of a revolution model uh, dating back to the heroic exploits of our uh, heroes of the epics and so on to Shivaji and Rana Pratap and more recently the 1857 heroes uh, of the Great Uprising. And on the other side, from a global perspective, inspired so much by uh, the Italian revolutionaries, uh, Mazzini and Garibaldi and the young Italy there that was formed with the same model that, you know, creating a dis disaffection uh, in the army, uh, in the Indian army, uh, the British Indian army would then be used as the most effective way to overthrow the empire uh, because the, the the entire edifice of the British Empire stood on the strength of the Indian army that was safeguarding it. And if the majority of them, uh, by the time of the Second World War, two and a half million uh, soldiers were Indians and there were only 40,000 British overlords. Uh, so if even a small fraction of this uh, Indian soldiers, their patriotic sentiments could be, uh, you know, they could be seduced enough to come on to the uh, side of the struggle, then they thought it was a matter of time before the sun actually did set on the empire. And that's perhaps precisely what happened with the case of the Royal Indian uh, Naval Mutiny, the uh, mutiny in the Air Force, the role of uh, INA and Netaji Subhash Chandra Bose and all of that that followed. So this was the model that Savarkar uh, built up. And I'm talking about this in uh, as early as the turn of the century, the, the turn of the 20th century, 1899, 1900, where he formed India's first ever secret society, uh, the Gupta Sanstha, uh, initially called Rashtra Bhakta Samuha, and then that metamorphoses into Mitra Mela, and then it becomes Abhinav Bharat, and soon, you know, it has membership across India. And very interestingly, uh, at a time when, you know, there were no WhatsApp groups, etc., to, uh, to communicate between people, the revolutionaries in Maharashtra were communicating and in contact all the time with revolutionaries in the exact opposite corner of the country in Bengal. Uh, the Anushilan Samiti, Aurobindo Ghosh, Barin Ghosh, Kudiram Bose, Prafulla Chaki, all of them were actually talking to each other. And uh, there was this constant uh, connection between everybody. And so the kind of uh, things that we hear in our history books that, you know, revolutions were just these uh, stray incidents uh, where, you know, hot blooded young men who threw a few bombs here and there and created, uh, uh, you know, political assassinations and so on. That was not true. There was a larger strategy where uh, Maharashtra, Bengal and later Punjab joining in 
this triumvirate, so to say, was actually actively involved in uh, having this revolutionary uh, zeal in India, which strove again for complete independence. And Savarkar was somebody who gave a call for total independence in 1905, uh, uh, protesting against the partition of Bengal. Uh, mind you, the Purna Swaraj uh, resolution of the Congress came only in 1930, 25 years later. But the revolutionaries were talking about total liberation uh, more than two decades before this. Uh, and you know, even the so-called moderates and the extremist faction within the Congress, they were not really talking about complete freedom uh, for the country at that particular point in time. And Savarkar, as a student in Pune's Ferguson College, organizes the first ever bonfire, first ever student bonfire of foreign goods protesting against Gurzan in 1905, for which he again becomes the first student in India to get rusticated from college for uh, you know uh, his activities in political, uh, creating political nuisance. And then, of course, he gets this scholarship from Shamji Krishnavarma uh, to go away to London uh, to study law, uh, the pretext of studying law. But then Shamji was also creating this focus of young nationalistic heroic men from different parts of India who could fight for the cause of Indian freedom from across the seas. And there was a reason why the Indian freedom movement almost moved across to Europe, because there it was so much more easier for uh, these people to carry on propaganda, the sedition laws were not as strict as they were in India. Um, so um, uh, Shamji himself was running this newspaper, um, uh, uh, the sociologist there, and Madam Hikaji Kama was uh, running Bande Matram, uh, Savarkar later brought out this uh, Talwar. So all these anti-government, so-called anti-government propaganda was, uh, you know, part of the course, and it was legitimate to do those things uh, in Europe. And so many of the uh, revolutionaries, not only from India, but also other colonies, they had all uh, made Europe a crucible of their activity. And that's those five stormy years that he spent there were literally the high point where the India house that he lived in, where Makranji, as you mentioned, there were these fascinating characters, again, who we seldom you know, know or speak about, whether it was Virindra Chattopadhyay, Shamji Krishnavarma, Sardar Singh Rana, BBS Ayer, MPT Acharya, Madan Lal Dhingra, uh, you know, uh, or Sikandar Hayat Khan, who later, of course, uh, goes on to become the premier in uh, the Muslim League uh, uh, provinces. So all these people were operating there in different parts of Europe. And uh, uh, Savarkar becomes almost there, so to say, of this India house in London, uh, where it's five years, there are a variety of things that he does. One is, of course, uh, you know, gets the whole, uh, you know, biography of Mazzini translated into Marathi and sent back to India. Uh, and then, uh, as Makranji mentioned, a re uh, revisiting of uh, India's past using British documents, uh, especially of the 1857 uprising, which was so-called, uh, hitherto, uh, you know, disparagingly called as just a sepoy mutiny, but relooking it as the first war of Indian independence and, uh, you know, almost kind of um, you know, laying down in that document uh, the principles of what constitutes a revolution, what are the driving forces behind a revolution. And Savarkar actually debunks this whole idea that it was just those greased cartridges and so on, which were the reason for uh, for the revolution. It's just uh, just a little bit of, uh, um, you know, a beef or pork lard cannot uh, cause an entire nation from Peshawar to Calcutta to rise uh, in uh, the kind of rebellion that it did. So there was a larger, uh, you know, underpinning of uh, that uh, that that movement, which was uh, both Swarajya and Swadharma, uh, your own uh, your own rule as well as for your own for the sake of your own religion, and that's where Hindus and Muslims joined hands together, in safeguarding both of this. Uh, and he puts this whole thing in perspective. And uh, among the many firsts to Savarkar's credit that I listed. The book tour was probably the only book which was banned even before it was published. Uh, and the, the British who had their uh, spies all over India House, they ensured that, uh, uh, you know, this book, in fact, uh, Churchill and the, uh, the Viceroy and uh, Lord Minto and others, they have these uh, jottings on official papers saying at any cost, this book should not come to India because it is highly, uh, you know, uh, the, the content is highly uh, uh, incriminating and it can uh, create uh, riots all over the country. And so uh, uh, that's that's when the book was banned. Even the way it was published was a uh, was a story in itself, where the manuscript, like Makranji mentioned, was smuggled in all these boxes, uh, false bottom boxes, and then brought first to uh, India to Sholap uh, to his 
Savarkar's elder brother Baba Rao, who sends it to Sholapur to a printing press. There is a police raid there, and so the manuscript is taken back. It's sent back to London. From there, it is sent to France. There, the French police are behind uh, the manuscript, and then it is taken away from France. It's sent to Germany. Then the Germans, they, they, you know, they thought that these are the people who know uh, a lot of the Devanagari script, the book being in Marathi, uh, given German, uh, you know, interest in Sanskrit and Indology and all of that. Uh, but then they made a whole mess of the. the type setting and so the manuscript had to, had to be withdrawn from there and then it goes to belgium and from there finally it gets uh, printed and then uh, translated by vvs ayer into english and then smuggled back to india this book uh, serves almost for two decades three decades after it was uh, uh, published in 1909 as a veritable bible for revolutionaries uh, bhagat singh was so inspired by this book he got the second edition of this book published and he almost made this as an entry criteria for uh, you know people uh, uh, recruits to the hsra whether they have read uh, this book by savarkar and two decades later you had netaji subhash chandra bose and rash bihari bose the founder of the ina uh, also you know getting copies of the book translated into different languages uh, japanese and even tamil uh, copies of which uh, being found there so all of this activity was uh, going on in london at the same time uh, arms were being smuggled back to india bombs were bomb manuals the uh, procedure to uh, make bombs uh, you know cyclostyled and sent back to india and these found resonances in different parts of india in the alipur bomb case uh, in which aurobindo uh, ghosh and his entire troop uh, got rounded off and also in nasik in the nasik murder case in which uh, anant lakshman kanhere Uh, a young revolutionary uh, kills an uh, an important uh, british official and in that process uh, you had savarkar's elder brother baba rao also being apprehended and taken away to kalapani and then the needle of suspicion goes back and then they trace him back and they they realize that this is this little puny little man who probably never wielded a gun or a weapon all his life but uh, the power of the pen being mightier than the sword was so intense for the british that almost all through his life he was always uh, categorized as a d category or a dangerous category criminal and the british wanted him back at any cost and so he was uh, as makranji mentioned the case was put on him uh, he was unfairly tried and he had actually run away as uh, you mentioned to paris uh, on the advice of his revolutionary friends who were there but then somewhere there he realizes that you know his associate madanlal dhingra has been executed his brother back home is uh, he gets news of his being sent away to jail and then also so many people uh, you know in his erstwhile abhinav bharat all being uh, you know rounded up and the the movement literally crumbling in front of his eyes and that's when uh, i think he puts a very false uh, you know hope in british jurisprudence and he says uh, like i mentioned earlier the whole sedition law not being so uh, you know strong there uh, he had a very good chance of actually not uh, getting convicted if he was properly tried in, in in london itself and that's what all the other revolutionary comrades of his were uh, trying so he wanted to get uh, himself Uh, honorably evicted out of all these cases and restart the movement uh, from from a clean slate and i really don't know why he needed the certificate from the british of uh, being clean uh, but then that was a huge lapse of judgment and as uh, you mentioned uh, makranji the minute he comes back to london he's arrested and then the british want to see that the, the, the man is tried not in london but back in india because that is the only place where he can be given the maximum punishment and so this extradition at any cost uh, that clause is put on him and he's uh, the fugitive and offenders act is invoked against him whereas he was not a fugitive he was a bona fide student who had gone there on a scholarship uh, so uh, churchill also in his jottings writes there as the home secretary saying at any cost we want this man back uh, you know in the indian jurisprudence Uh, and back in india too uh, and the whole his uh, jumping ship and at the port of masai in france that becomes a case in itself where it goes to the international court of uh, arbitration at hague uh, quite like the jadhav case we are having between india and pakistan today uh, because savarkar being a lawyer said you know i have jumped out of the ship and gone into french soil and so now uh, the british have lost their uh, jurisdiction over me and so if i need to be handed over to the british it is up to the uh, french government whether they they give me asylum 
or they give it give me up to the british so that becomes a case in itself and there too the british want to ensure that he is brought to book in india and so they amount the maximum amount of pressure on france and ensure that uh, you know he's uh, uh, he loses the case at a and the uh, trial commences in india where he's not given a jury he's not given a right to appeal uh, so it's a fixed uh, outcome already and he's probably given the maximum punishment that uh, uh, anybody in the uh, revolutionary history other than of course execution was given which is of two life transportations amounting to 50 long years so this was 1910 and so uh, he was always had this uh, this uh, you know patti around his neck which said 1960 which is when he would be released uh, from jail so that uh, completes one major the part of savarkar as the revolutionary and the second part of his life then begins of savarkar as uh, you know the, the the person who suffered the kind of uh, tortures that he did at kalapani uh, under uh, barry the jailer there uh, the, the most basic of human rights also not being uh, offered not only to him but also to several other almost 100 plus political prisoners there of good food basic toilet facilities uh, you know medicines uh, or med- medical care when they were fell sick school who ka bail uh, punishment where they had to go round and round the oil grinding mill to extract a certain amount of oil every day uh, all of that and uh, solitary confinement for several months that uh, he faced uh, you know in, the, in that time all of this happens then and that also becomes a time which comes which brings savarkar into contention uh, for the so called uh, court and court mercy petitions uh, that he signed uh, then and in my book i have actually uh, you know in the appendix to the book all the uh, petitions have been put uh, in toto uh, there were six uh, of them and some of them filed by his uh, wife and younger brother narayan rao and so on so all of this have been put there and uh, you know it's been made out that it's it's uh, it, it was a very special privilege that was given only to him uh, to file a petition which was not the case uh, it was it was a common agency just as you could employ the agency of a lawyer to file a case political prisoners were given the option to file clemency and particularly that decade 1910 to 1920 when you had the uh, shift of india's capital from calcutta to delhi you had the coronation of emperor george you had the uh, the start and the end of the world, first world war during all these occasions uh, britain gave several opportunities to political prisoners not only in india but in colonies across the world uh, as a goodwill gesture to apply for clemency and the the option was given and several of the uh, prisoners applied for it in uh, port blair itself there were others who applied and many of them actually got uh you know remission or they got uh, release uh, as well in fact uh, sachindranath samyal another famous revolutionary who was there in port blair along with uh, savarkar writes in his uh, autobiography uh, mera bandi jeevan that i was advised by savarkar to file a petition and i filed same the same kind of text that he did i was released but he was not uh, released because the british actually feared that uh, releasing him and the, uh, his elder brother baba rao would actually reignite the revolutionary zeal in the bombay presidency that had come down over the years and that was one reason they did not want him out and they wanted him to keep these two people as much as possible so there are several other factors about that including you know his 1917 petition where among other things he says uh, that if my name constitutes an obstacle in the release of all the other prisoners then please delete my name and release the others and that will give me as much a uh, pleasure as my own release would do so he was being like a spokesperson for all the other uh, political prisoners of the time and interestingly a british government official reginald cradock who comes to interview savarkar and several other political prisoners of the, of uh, kalapani they also talk about he also talks about how you know in the interview he expressed no remorse no uh, regret for what he had done so there are several contemporary accounts too that talk about this and at the same time very interestingly 1920 when savarkar's younger brother narayan rao approaches mahatma gandhi and asks for his help to release his elder brothers gandhi ji himself advises uh, them to file a petition and he himself files a petition on their behalf uh, saying you know they are brave men they probably erred and now they want to get back to the constitutional process uh, of the congress and with the montagu chancellor reforms that have kicked in 
this is a time for reform so please let them out and so on so this whole bogey of this petition and because of that you know the whole idea that uh, uh, he had sold out and so on i think that is uh, a little far from truth because uh, all through his life even after port blair the british did not seem to trust him at all and that's one reason he was held in house arrest uh, for the longest period of time uh, from initial 5 years to later 13 years so 14 plus 13 27 years of a man's life the prime of his life actually spent either in jail or in captivity and being totally outside the realm of any kind of uh, social work or so uh, you know public work that he could do uh, that was what savarkar faced in his life the third uh, you know phase of his life was savarkar as the ideologue of this uh, uh, concept of hindutva uh, or the whole idea of hinduness and what that means particularly in india today where it is in uh, in political ascendancy now that too uh, seen in a in a social political context i think makes a lot of sense uh, and not in isolation where you know in 1923 he writes this uh, while he was holed up in the ratnagiri jail he writes this slim book called essentials of hindutva and who is a hindu in the context that india was in at that time which was of the khilafat movement that was going on which uh, i personally consider as a very dangerous movement that was launched of course with uh, all the good intentions of creating a hindu muslim unity and bringing a lot of the uh, you know the the muslim masses into the mass uh, freedom struggle but then the whole idea of appealing on communal lines and bringing religion into politics and assuring uh, you know the 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 uh, uh, people of um, on on completely communal lines of liberation of a of a communal figure several thousands of kilometers away from india and to kind of say that your allegiance to india is dependent on uh, what you do uh, you know uh, for the liberation of someone somewhere else a caliph in turkey and the people of turkey themselves did not want him and uh, mustafa kemal atatürk comes over there so that i think was a, a very dangerous uh, game that was being played and the consequences were immense you had uh uh you know with the 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 carnages uh, that followed in uh, the mokla carnage in uh, malabar in kohat in panipat in delhi calcutta different parts of india and the response of the congress and particularly gandhi in most of those was largely pacifist and uh, you know more admonishing of the the hindu rather than of the uh, the perpetrator of the violence and so they needed to be somebody who uh, you know gave this uh you know intellectual counter to this uh, entire uh you know uh, policy and that's what savarkar did through this book interestingly while all his other writings were in marathi this book was in english so very clearly he had a pan indian readership in his mind and there he postulates his uh, theory as to who is a hindu and right at the start he says hindutva has nothing to do with the theological constructs of hinduism the religion and he himself being very anti uh, you know uh, rituals anti uh, so to say orthodoxy uh, he said i don't have much to do with the religion hinduism is just a subset of this larger umbrella of hinduism so what exactly was this so when he gives this formula that anybody who lives within the uh, indus and the oceans who considers this land mass as both their pitrubhumi and punya bhumi their the land of their forefathers and also their holy land not in terms of religious holy land but in terms of they owing their allegiance to this uh, this landmass and not to some sultan sitting somewhere else i think uh, that person uh, is qualified to be called as a hindu again not as a religious uh, definition but as a cultural and a nationalistic identity marker you could be a, a jain buddhist muslim parsi christian anything seek uh, and still be called a hindu was what uh, was his hypothesis and this is the same blood uh, flows in all of our uh, veins and so there is no difference between a brahmin a nayar a jangama a sikh a jain a tribal in andaman because we are all the same and so uh, marrying among ourselves uh, eating among ourselves all this should be uh, is completely accepted uh, so that there, there needs to be no uh, reason for differences among us so and he also answers in one of those uh, you know hypothesis what about people like say an ani besant or a sister nivedita who were certainly from another religion uh, they came to india so it was not their pitrubhumi uh, so what do we call them as and he says there too that these people were probably more devoted to india than indigenous indians 
so it was certainly not their pitru bhumi but it was their punya bhumi they considered this land as their holy land it was their karma bhumi too so to that extent they are also hindus so uh, so it was a very very uh, different kind of a uh, conceptualization that was done in the context where people were being called upon to show allegiance extra territorial uh, allegiance to uh, political figures outside of india and so to that con uh, to that extent to give that uh, construct and also to consolidate the hindu society which is splintered into so many different castes and creeds uh, he hypothesized hindutva in 1923 and in the next phase of his life uh, which is savarkar as a social reformer uh, in the 13 years that he was holed up in ratnagiri where initially he was said it was told that for the first 5 years you are not supposed to participate in politics uh, but then that uh, period was extended every 5 5 5 years and it came 13 years later on so that itself you know flies in the face of the uh, normal uh, you know uh, allegation that he had become a british stooge and collaborator so if somebody is your collaborator then you don't need to put them under house arrest you can give them complete freedom to do what they want so the very fact that the british were not willing to release him and it was only 1937 after a you know the elections you had a uh, indian uh, government that came up in bombay province that uh, the premier of bombay uh, state uh, ensured that savarkar got released so till the end the british really did not trust him but in these 13 years he put this hindutva theory into practice uh, through his social reforms that he championed there of inter caste uh, you know marriage inter caste dining the first ever cafe in ratnagiri where people of all castes and communities could sit together and eat the first ever temple called the patit pavan mandir uh, which was opened in 1931 where people of all communities could actually uh, uh, you know go and pray together you had a bhangi a chamar as the as the as the priest uh, and even the brahmin had to go and uh, you know worship there and you had an asprishya ganapati an untouchable ganapati which was uh, created of the uh, so called lower caste uh, for whom everybody including the so called upper caste could go and were asked to go and pray with so um, you know entry of children belonging to the so called untouchable uh, communities into schools uh, uh, where people of the upper caste were also there and to, for them to sit together and after a lot of social upheaval a lot of social Uh, challenges this was finally achieved after four five years of struggle a lot of backlash that he faced uh, you know at the at the hands of the orthodox uh, you know in maharashtra uh, so th- th- this these 13 years be- uh, became his social uh, laboratory or experiments uh, in ratnagiri where he said, uh, he gave an he gave a practical example of how uh, you know th- th- this unity of the hindu society could be achieved and if one actually analyzes the social reforms that savarkar embarked uh, they are very much in consonance uh, with uh, dr baba saheb bhimrao ambedkar's uh, views and the two of them have exchanged a lot of letters to among each other and ambedkar himself writes several times that you are the only one uh, who's understood the root cause of this whole caste problem which is the varnashram uh, system and you call for a complete disemberment of the varna system uh, which is the only way the jati uh, pratha can come out and not by piecemeal reforms of uh, you know harijan udhar or untouchable uh, untouchability removal uh, a complete breaking down a nihilism so to say uh, in society was needed for us to achieve uh, this so that the, the the consonance in views to a large extent between both ambedkar and savarkar both coming from the same uh, geographical province uh, become something that is uh, pertinent to know the next phase of savarkar's life is him as uh, a politician where he enters active politics uh, becomes a president of the all india hindu mahasabha from 1937 to 44 uh, 1944 in those turbulent years of the second world war and here too uh, he becomes an active champion of uh, the hindu uh, the, the hindu voice particularly in politics uh, and in the run up to the partition somebody who opposed Uh, the concept of partition, the, uh, the concept of uh, you know the, the the need itself for having uh, a, a communal separation in the country, uh, and a, a perpetual opponent not only of Gandhi but also of Jinnah uh, you know, during this time. And the Hindu Mahasabha itself was a ragtag sort of a party. Uh, it was not even a political party before he came in. It was an appendage of the Congress 
and he revitalized and made it fighting fit enough to uh, contest elections, not with much success, but to some extent, it gave uh, quite a bit of a challenge to uh, the Congress, particularly in uh, targeting Hindu voters uh, during these uh, times. And during his presidency of the Hindu Mahasabha, his speeches there uh, are compiled in uh, a book called the Hindu Rashtra Darshan, where he time and time again mentions you know, what is this concept of the Hindu Rashtra that I have, uh, the, the much reviled uh, behemoth uh, kind of a concept, which is probably subsuming of all religious minorities and so on. Where he says, my conception of a, a Hindu Rashtra, the constitution of a free Hindu Rashtra is one where everybody is equal in the eyes of the law. There is, uh, there is no discrimination on the basis of caste, creed, religion, gender, etc. for anybody. And uh, the majority community does not get any extra privileges by virtue of being more in number. And by converse, the minority doesn't get any concessions because they are a minority. Everybody is equal in the eyes of the law. You could carry on with whatever religious practices, your pujas and namas and all of that in the confines of your house. Don't bring your religion into public and into politics. Uh, and including you know, the, the fact that uh, he says uh, uh, the exact phrase that he uses is our non-Hindu brethren need not even have the ghost of suspicion that the Hindu Rashtra will encroach upon their religious, their cultural, or their uh, you know uh, their linguistic rights. And if at all there is any encroachment, the state must ensure that that is uh, remedied and cured, and everybody is free to do what they want. And including the state can subsidize some of the things like you know say madrasas or churches and pilgrimages and all these things can be subsidized by the government, but then th there also he put a formula, a very utilitarian, non-emotional formula, which says the amount of subsidy a community gets, uh, a religious community gets, should be directly proportional to the amount of tax it pays to the national exchequer. So if you are useful to the national economy, then you can claim some benefits back, a tax return. Otherwise, you can't be a burden on the uh, on the national exchequer and still, uh, you know, uh, demand and, it's, you know, uh, uh, expect to get uh, uh, whatever concessions. So this kind of uh, theory that he uh, propounded for uh, the, the unified, uh, you know, uh, India, of course, time and time again, even now we are told that uh, this whole two nation theory uh, that came about was something that he uh, propounded and it was he who, uh, you know, sowed the seed, which is again, I think a little far from truth because I think it was way back with Sir Syed Ahmed Khan and so on, who uh, got this whole idea of uh, two nations and uh, so on. But uh, Savarkar time and again mentions that, yes, there are two nations within India, as long as there is a section within a particular community here, which owes its allegiance, uh, not to this country, but to a larger Uma or a universal brotherhood. So till the time that is there, till the time, uh, you know, Indian interest, Indian, uh, um, uh, you know, Indian allegiance is not primary and you have these extraterritorial allegiances, there are two nations. But the minute that will go away uh, and there is complete emotional integration within this country, then there is no two nation theory at all. And so time and again, when he was compared with Jinnah, he does mention in one of his press interviews too, uh, that uh, Jinnah and I are completely different. He stands for concessions after concessions for a particular community. I'm calling for equality of everything. And uh, I actually think there are two nations in the construct that I mentioned, as long as there is this uh, tendency to look uh, beyond your borders. So that was in the, in the 1940s. But then again, uh, this was also the time of the test of his leadership, where I would say that he failed uh, to a large extent in creating mass movements, uh, particularly the kind that Gandhi did. Uh, time and again, there was a promise of a direct action, uh, you know, by the Hindu Mahasabha, which never materialized. There was a lot of, uh, uh, you know, uh, distrust and uh, uh, misunderstandings between him and his immediate protege, uh, Dr. Shama Prasad Mukherjee, who later became the president of the Hindu Mahasabha and later, of course, the progenitor of the Jan Sangh and the future Bharatiya Janta Party, uh, so to say. So they, they, they had a lot of differences of opinion on many things. So, so Savarkar as a leader, uh, particularly, and when, when one puts him against, say, Gandhi and the way he managed to galvanize the masses or even get people uh, to listen to him, uh, they, those were his uh, huge failings there where uh, uh, he could not manage to 
build that mass appeal for himself. Also, many of his views too, like Makranji mentioned, uh, you know, about cow worship and cow not being, uh, you know, divine, and uh, he he just believed in cow protection and so on. And this whole caste uh, and social reform, where it was a nihilist approach uh, and not a you know a step by step kind of a social reform. All of this also ensured that uh, he lost the support of many sections of society. Uh, so that mass appeal, uh, something that Gandhi uh, managed to get, was something that Savarkar could never uh, get in those years. Though he was hugely popular uh, in the years of his presidency uh, of the Hindu Mahasabha. The final uh, you know, phase of his life after which I will uh, conclude and open up for questions was, of course, his implication in uh, Gandhi's murder. Uh, again, a case which was uh, which is highly contested even to this day, uh, uh, even as I'm rummaging through pages and pages and pages of documents uh, and several uh, very notable books that have been written on this uh, topic, including Tushar Gandhi's uh, book, as well as Malgonkar's, uh, Manohar Malgonkar's, uh, The Men Who Killed Gandhi, you know, it became, and the actual court papers, the testimonies in the court of Atma Charan, where uh, this was uh, tried in the Red Fort trials, uh, it becomes clear that this was a motley group of, uh, of rabid and lunatical elements, uh, the, the, the real violent elements within the Hindu Mahasabha, uh, led by Bodse and Apte and Karkare and all these different people, uh, who, uh, you know, the ultimate, till the last minute, till 12th January when, uh, 1948, when Gandhi announced his uh, plan to go on a fast and to death uh, till the time Nehru's government uh, made good the promise of uh, handing over 55 crores to Pakistan at the time when Pakistan was actually at invading uh, you know, our, our borders in Kashmir. Till then, these uh, motley group of uh, crazy lunatics did not even know, uh, did not even plan to assassinate Gandhi. Uh, they had all kinds of grand plans uh, from you know wanting to go and bomb the constituent assembly of Pakistan, uh, when they didn't did not even know what grenades are and how to how to even uh, you know uh, rip open a bomb and throw it they had absolutely no clue uh, someone wanted to assassinate jinnah someone wanted to blow up the constituent assembly someone wanted to raid the uh, uh, the the van the, the the vehicle that was going of the nizam's uh, treasury Uh, better now we lost your audio vikram ji now uh, now yeah. Any better? Yeah, yeah yeah so so uh, all these kind of grand plans and from 12th january is when they finally uh, decide to change their target they needed a they needed to do something they had these grand plans but did not know how to execute that and the target showed itself up when you know in their tele printer, the, the news comes up that Gandhi is going on a fast and he's also asking many of the Hindu and Sikh refugees to go back to Pakistan and that creating a lot of consternation among the refugees itself who were uh, gathering around uh, Birla house saying uh, that if he wants to die, let him die. I mean, we don't really care, uh, you know, and we have that famous scene where Nehru also gets on to the top of his car and says, who is it who, uh, you know, ask Gandhi to die and must kill me before you can do that and all of that. So this very charged atmosphere, so in all of a span of five to six days, the first attempt that is made on his life on 20th January in the prayer meeting uh, where Madanlal Pawa aborted attempt of throwing a bomb at him, uh, uh, you know, is unsuccessful. This is this five to seven days is all that they had to actually, you know, do, uh, to plan any conspiracy. And in all of that, this whole circumstantial evidence that was given by a very, very dubious man, this Bhadge, Digambar Bhadge, who was a part of this plan, who actually was the betrayer of the cause in that Madanlal Pahava, uh, you know, bomb episode. He was supposed to actually shoot at Gandhi uh, after Pahava, you know, throws a bomb and creates a scare, but he runs away because he gets scared and he sees some one-eyed man and he's considered it as a bad omen and runs away and so all kinds of confusion. So this, it is only this Bhadge who comes up and gives this testimony that uh, we all went to Savarkar and then he gave us this pistol, which was again false. It was got from Gwalior, the uh, the, the, the Beretta pistol that they, uh, Nathuram finally uses. Uh, and so uh, this 
phrase of yashasvi hoon ya of be successful and come so it's an operation as clumsy as this uh, i mean even to give credit to savarkar the revolutionary who was a part of several other political assassinations in the past to uh, to 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 even bless something like this or come out so openly uh, you know in support of uh, this and actually in front of a stranger uh, like badge to go and say such things to a nathuram it's uh, highly unlikely and all the circumstantial evidence that was uh, gathered was what was ins- ensured that he was acquitted while all the other seven people uh, his terms it was savarkar who did not uh, who was acquitted honorably by the court uh, and of course the kapoor commission that was set up later uh, with an ambit that was not to get into the details of the assassins or who did what but then it went beyond its scope and the commission report itself was accused of uh, you know political bias it was never tabled it was there was no action taken report on it uh, and it died its own death uh, which uh, by when savarkar was also uh, he had ended his life in 1966 but then uh, having said all this and nathuram goat say his own testimony uh, which was actually banned by uh, the congress for several uh, decades and much later his brother gopal goat say brings it out where he says after 1942 savarkar was a different man he was a pacifist and we were very very disillusioned with him even when we went to him with uh, reports of how we had disrupted gandhi's speeches in some places uh, he admonished us saying this is not the way to do while we were expecting him to feed us for what we did so we got disillusioned with all this old uh, foggies of the hindu sabha whether it was savarkar or munje and bhopatkar and others and we decided to chart our own course they were no longer going to help the hindu sangathan cause and we needed to do something ourselves and that's how they branched away uh, into what they did the the violent uh, lunatic uh, fring fringe of the hindu mahasabha uh, and he also mentions in his own testimony that savarkar did not actually have any idea of this whole conspiracy the whole circumstance it's a it's an alfred hitchcock novel in itself as to how these people uh, got dropped off at savarkar's house and nobody saw whether they actually went inside or not but uh, there was some actress with whom they had gone along with and that actress gave this uh, testimony in court so it's a huge Uh, you know uh, comedy of errors uh, which ended as a huge tragedy for savarkar selling his legacy not only then but i think till date where even now the uh, despite being honorably acquitted by the courts i think the long albatross the long shadow of uh, gandhi's assassination the the taint associated with that uh, continues to stick on him the moral taint so to say and this albatross comes into it i come back to where i began from which is uh the reason why he also comes into contemporary discourse so often because and any of the political opponents of today's political dispensation if they need to uh you know uh strike darts at today's political dispensation they invariably go back to savarkar whom they see as the ideological ancestor so to say of uh, today's uh, leadership and say yeah you did not contribute anything to the freedom struggle you did not uh, you were stooges you were assassins you were all of this so in all of this political brohaha i think uh, history becomes the biggest casualty and in the process also the legacy of a man who had numerous failings uh, but at the same time is i think demonized a lot more than he, what he actually deserves and uh, to this day uh, even the question uh, of whether he needs to be given the country's highest honor the bharat ratna and so on becomes a matter of intense debate intense contention uh, largely because of these uh, difficult aspects of his life whether it's his uh, propounding of hindutva or more importantly the uh, the the uh, the gandhi uh, murder case so but then in conclusion i would only say that uh, as savarkar himself mentions in his uh samagra vangmay and as i have uh, i quoted in the beginning that uh, you know a, a rose is described with all of it the thorns uh, included so i think the idea is to have these open discussions have these open forums where all our all our uh, leaders of the past are open for scrutiny and not made into these idols and icons who are beyond uh, judgment who are beyond whether it's a gandhi it's a nehru it's a savarkar a jinnah an ambedkar the holy cows that we make out of them uh, and uh, that i think uh, takes away all the uh, you know academic opportunity to assess them for uh, future generations 
and particularly seven decades after independence, and we're going to have 75 years of freedom uh, shortly. I think a very dispassionate, unemotional assessment of these characters of the past, the role that they've played in our freedom struggle, their positives and their failings. I think we as a society, as an intellectual community, we need to be more open uh, to that. And uh, people need not lose their jobs uh, just because they are associated with a person or they write a biography of a person. So with those words, thank you so much uh, for a patient hearing and thank you Makaranji for this opportunity. That was splendid uh, Vikramji. I would say riveting and uh, you, you didn't even pause. It was uh, an outpouring mm -hmm. and yet it was very coherent, very cogent. You began with the problems of uh, a biographical project. You went back to, uh, you know, Virginia Woolf and I would have thought uh, Lytton Strachey who wrote oh, yes. Victorians yes. in 1918. And for the first time, uh, there was an attempt to portray these great figures, Watts and all. And of course, another important uh, sort of footnote to your, uh, you know, very deep, uh, I would say, reflection on the problem of writing a biography was how to get to something beyond the external appearance of, a, of an individual, howsoever famous he or she may have been, how to get to the core, to the inside of that person. And there, I think Gandhi's autobiography is exemplary because he bears his soul to us. Whereas Nehru doesn't. Nehru's biography is much more uh, focused on the external. So it makes us think deeply how to get into that inner being. And I think when I read your book, I found that one of the things you did is you humanized Savarkar. And at one level, he was cold, rational, absolutely dispassionate. But at another level, he was very sentimental when he writes to his wife uh, from the Andamans, when he writes to his brothers, when he says goodbye to India, when he says goodbye even to England, you know, uh, and so forth. He was a deeply sentimental man, you know, and he steeled himself for the worst sufferings which he saw in the face. He, he was a romantic revolutionary, but he was, I would say, very realistic about what he was uh, sticking his neck out, you know, for. And I think you've brought that out. So I, once again, I think it's a very, very readable biography and very well documented. Now, I also wanted to mention another important thing that you referred to, which is that, uh, you know, as uh, Professor Singh, MP Singh, who was chairing Dr. Chahel's session on Gandhi, he said that while we, de while we need not diminish Gandhi's contribution to the freedom movement, very made British India practically ungovernable. And he filled defenseless masses with a sense of fearlessness and hope, you know, to stand up uh, with a moral courage against the might of the greatest empire that humankind has known. So Gandhiji uh, and what he did cannot be, uh, as it were, completely denied. At the same time, it's very important to see, as you rightly said, what the revolutionaries did, uh, what people like Savarkar, uh, to Subhash Chandra Bose, with Bhagat Singh and all the others uh, did to rouse the conscience of the people and incite the Indians to revolt, right? So I think a more balanced picture of how the British left India is absolutely required for the times. And, you know, coming back to Lytton Strachey, see what happened is from, you know, hagiographical accounts, because the hagiography is the life of a saint. You know, that was the source of uh, European biographies. You know, everything comes from religious texts. I mean, frankly, and then you secularize them and you write as Attenborough did of Gandhi, you make a saint out of Gandhi. And the opposite is that you write anti-biographies, which I said Gandhi must fall, everyone must fall. So I think the corrective biography, if any, is one that uh, steers a middle course, a madhyama course, from the extremes of an anti-biography and a hagiography. And I think you managed to do that uh, very eloquently with, with Savarkar. And I'm glad you brought up, uh, I mean, you, you didn't shy away from controversial topics like the Hindu Rashtra or even uh, the Gandhi assassination. Now, I must recommend, Vikramji, my own book to you, The Death and Afterlife of Mahatma Gandhi. Please Very do read there. it. It's there, right there. <laughs> you do read it where, you see, my, my argument is a little different because 
you know, I want to enlarge the circle of responsibility. And, uh, you know, the Kundalal Kapoor Commission clearly shows that the conspiracy was much wider than expected. And in the Agrani masthead, you had a picture of Savarkar. So, you know, there is, there is a lot of gray. There's a lot of gray in this whole uh, business. And uh, especially when Gopal Godse was fettered on being released for good conduct, and Kelkar and others threw a party in his honor, so to speak, of civic function. So we realized a lot of people wanted Gandhi dead. And the same folks had tried to attack Gandhi in a knife attack earlier and so forth. But you're absolutely right. Godse and company were really confused. You didn't mention how they also wanted to uh, attack the Nizam of Hyderabad and, and uh, you know, cross the border to liberate Hyderabad. They were very confused, I agree. The gun was a disaster. They, and ultimately, they got it from Dr. Parchure, an Ayurvedic doctor in Gwalior, etc., etc. But I think, you know, Nurani and others' books, you know, of course, they're hatchet jobs, but it's very interesting. There's so many gray areas. We may never know the truth. And certainly from Dhananjay Kir to today, there are many gray areas about Savarkar's life, about which his lips were zipped till the very end. And finally, finally, you rightly said, let us not you know, over-politicize the manner in which these great figures have been represented. Because if you politicize everything, then writing a biography of Savarkar itself will be a political act for which you can be ostracized or given whatever, some great benefit, I don't know, in the present regime. So I think it's very important for people like us to maintain a certain degree of independence because our dharma as intellectuals and scholars is not necessarily to join any particular narrative, but to really bring out the truth. And I think that's where social scientists, people in the humanities, as well as scientists, share a common quest, which is to try and bring out as much of the truth as possible, so that ultimately a discerning public, I'm, I'm using your phrase, is given the wherewithal, you know, to, to come to its own conclusion. So much as we may be, you know, tagged or attacked or tackled for being on this side or that side. I think that flame of the writer, of the intellectual, should be kept burning. And I know you've been victimized. You're the founder of the Bangalore Literary Festival, to which I was invited, uninvited, then reinvited, and so forth. All this rubbish. You know, and we don't play this game. Beyond a point, we do what we have to do. And I think one of the reasons I admire you is that you continue to do what you think is your dharma as a writer. And you write not just about Savarkar, you write about Gohar Jan, you know, who is, of course, an Armenian Christian. As I, as I read from your book, I didn't know that, who then got converted. Her mom got converted. I mean, so much I've learned. And uh, you can also, in the question hour, maybe tell us about your other projects. I know that you're a great collector of art and music. I know that your own collection of music, especially 78 RPMs, is something phenomenal. So you're a collector, you're a curator, uh, and I'm sure that uh, you, you, you still consult with uh, and work for multinationals. You've got an independent source of income. So you're your own person, and I admire that. Now, uh, Vikramji, we've already had two, we have two questions. I'll begin with those. These are from Dr. Chahel. He says, Dr. Ambedkar writes in Pakistan of Pakistan, something of India, that while taking talking of Hindu Rashtra, Savarkar was standing on the same platform where, with Jinnah. Uh, how do you comment on this? So that's the first question that according to Dr. Ambedkar, I'm not familiar with this particular remark, but anyhow, uh, Dr. Chahal says Ambedkar said that Savarkar was standing on the same platform with Jinnah. That's the first question. Second question about social reform, says Dr. Chahal, uh, we agree that he was for the annihilation of uh, caste, but was it for the Sangathan of Hindus? Was his position a result of the fear of possible conversion of Dalits to other religions? These are two questions. And others, please send their questions by chat or raise your hand, please, so that I can see you. Thank you. Uh, that's a great question. In fact, on what... Uh, so I think Dr. Ambedkar, can I look at his writings and particularly this book uh, I think came out in 1940 and then 45 uh, Pakistan and thoughts on partition uh, so uh, he he uh, 
this is only i mean i i would say part quoting of what uh, he said about what savarkar uh, you know uh, uh, he equated the two of them and that was a, a constant allegation that he faced and i mentioned that uh, in my talk as well that everybody did think of him as the other side the other side of the coin and how he was constantly on the defensive saying how me and jina uh, were different while he stood for concessions i actually stand for equality of everybody and so on so uh, in fact i uh, quite uh, you know coincidentally i had that particular page open of that book and i'd like to read a little of what um, dr ambedkar said uh, during that time and then that probably puts the whole idea uh, in a better perspective ambedkar uh, says and i quote uh, islam divides as inexorably as it binds islam is a close corporation and the distinction that it makes between muslims and non muslims is very real very positive and a very alienating distinction the brotherhood of islam is not the universal brotherhood of man it is brotherhood of muslims for muslims only there is fraternity but its benefit is confined to those within that corporation for those who are outside the corporation there is nothing but contempt and enmity the second defect of islam is that it is a system of social self government and it's incompatible with local self government because the allegiance of a muslim does not rest on his domicile in the country which is his but on the faith to which he belongs wherever there is a rule of islam there is that is his own country in other words islam can never allow a true muslim to adopt india as his motherland uh, and regard a hindu as his kith and kin that is probably the reason why molan and something else and according to the muslim canon law the world is divided into two camps darul islam the abode of islam and darul harb the abode of war country is darul islam and it is ruled by muslims country is darul harb when muslims only reside in it but are not rulers of it that being the canon law of the muslims india cannot be the common motherland of the hindus and the muslims it can be the land of the muslims but it cannot be the land of the hindus and the muslims living as equals further it can be the land of the muslims only when it is governed by the muslims the you know quoted in toto from what dr ambedkar wrote uh, but today i don't know if uh, this quote of ambedkar will be thrown up at his face and he will be called an islamophobe uh, in the way that and, and savarkar's writings pale in comparison to what he has said about how the, the, the two, savarkar was still saying that the two communities can live together Uh, in this country and have their own uh, you know freedom of worship etc whereas ambedkar was actually saying that the two are totally incompatible with each other this whole construct that uh, you know it was a british who created divide and rule and all that ambedkar disagreed with that he said the two communities are fundamentally and civilizationally they are opposed to each other and they have a history of strife uh, which will make it in, impossible for them to come under one roof and so why he attacked savarkar was and i quote that part of his as well where it says strange as it may appear mr savarkar and mr jinha instead of being opposed to each other uh, on the one nation versus two nation theories are in complete agreement about it both agree not only agree but insist that there are two nations in india one the muslim nation and the other the hindu nation they differ only as regards the terms and conditions on which the two nations should live Mr Jinnah says India should be cut up into two Pakistan and Hindustan but Mr Savarkar on the other hand insists that although these are two nations in India India shall not be divided into two parts that the two nations shall dwell in one country shall live under the mantle of one single constitution and the constitution uh, will be uh, will be such that the Hindu nation will be enabled to occupy a predominant position that is due to it and the Muslim nation may to live in the position of subordinate cooperation within it so his uh, whole you know opposition so to say or his critique of savarkar's uh, idea was that you know you're saying there are two nations uh, but then he didn't catch the fact that what was being propounded was a to live in peace with a common law it's not a hindu law or a hindu nation law that uh, he was talking about but then he says if you're saying there are two nations you're allowing them their own culture their own uh, you know religion their language their flag or whatever you're creating a nation within a nation uh, and so in such situations globally either uh, the majority nation overpowers and takes over the minority nation or it allows the minority nation to break away and create its own entity so uh, when you're doing neither of it he calls this position of savarkar as queer 
so so that i think is the context in which ambedkar makes this in a larger hypothesis of why he actually found the two communities to be absolutely impossible so it was a very maximalist kind of a position that the two uh, communities can simply not live together in peace whereas actually in, in comparison savarkar is giving some credit to the fact that we can probably try and see if we can come together under a common secular law and uh, uh, the only criteria being you please owe the allegiance to this country and not to some other uh, nation somewhere else so that was the whole idea uh, i would say uh, of uh, ambedkar and savarkar on this whole concept of two nation and jinna and so on the other thing about yes uh, that is also a fair point on the whole consolidation now what uh, there may be different uh, i think motivations that these leaders had when it came to uh, you know consolidation of communities now even ambedkar that way was constantly also looking at political consolidation of the depressed classes uh, whether it was the run up to the pune pact with gandhi or uh, you know this in his representations in the round table conferences or separate uh, amount of seats etc for the depressed uh, classes so similarly savarkar uh, i think there were uh, two pronged one was of course this unification of hindu society which uh, he had found in his uh, uh, you know uh, stint at the kalapani in uh, port blair where he found that it was so easy for the muslim jamadars who were uh, posted there uh, to kind of uh, very easily convert a hindu prisoner uh, to 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 convert to islam Uh, but at the same time there was no option for the hindu to come back uh, to the fold so this whole idea of shuddhi etc that he uh, you know inspired by arya samaj and swami dayanand saraswati and later swami shraddhanand and others to bring people back into the fold and to consolidate the community because that was also the time of the communal award uh, where uh, different communities were being given representation in the different legislatures based on the numerical strength so in the 1921 census in the 1931 census the 41 census most of which the congress actually boycotted the census even while they supported the communal award and did savarkar oppose saying you know you have already signed the death warrant so you'd rather go through the whole thing because in the census if you had uh, everybody signing up as sanatani arya samajis uh, and different different sub groups lingayats jangams etc and not as hindu then your number Uh, as a community is just going to diminish so badly that you are going to become a minority in this country though you actually belong to the so called hindu pantheon but the very fact that you don't identify yourself as a hindu uh, would make you lose your electoral significance so to say and those were the times of numbers and proportional representation to population where the minority was actually begin, being given more representation uh, it was not one man one vote it was more than that so in such a scenario uh, uh, his plea and also that of the hindu mahasabha whether it was shama prasad mukherjee in bengal where uh, a misrepresentation of the census calculation ensured that for a long time the hindus were shown as a very very small minority in bengal which was not the case so uh, th their contention was you could say whatever you are sanatani but within brackets you are hindu so that you come under this larger rubric uh, you may be any caste etc but you call yourself hindu so that your overall numerical strength also remains same so one is of course yes this whole uh, idea of being able to uh, not get poached by uh, by proselytizing religions uh, was a, a factor to consolidate uh, the society and the second factor was also political where you know at a, and they all knew that it was a matter of time Uh, when the british are going to leave india and at that particular time it was your competitive numbers your military strength of the two most warring uh, factions and communities which was going to come up in the event of a civil war so how you consolidate and how you create this sangathan so to say was very uh, important not only for the life property the faiths the the very existence of a major community in the country thank you vikram ji i think you answered very well i'm uh, particularly uh, you know impressed by how you brought out uh, you know the fact that competitive consolidation was a fact of the times and was partly an outcome of the census in fact a lot of ills that we continue to face are a product of that census because they make religious and, and other ethnic affiliations mutually exclusive otherwise you could be this and that 
And I think you you like you rightly pointed out how uh, the political uh, motive to delegitimate a Hindu consolidation and to exalt all other kind of minoritarian consolidations was the crisis point, you see, and I think that was very well answered. Now, back to the uh, Dr. Ambedkar and Savarkar debate, uh, I just had a little query there, which is that uh, I think what Ambedkar was saying is that he wanted everybody uh, to be an Indian citizen under equal, uh, you know, with equal rights and under the same law. And he claimed, if you read what you, I mean, I, I heard what you read out, he claimed that Savarkar was in some ways relegating Muslims to second class citizenship. However, you have argued that that was not necessarily the case. But when we read that, uh, you know, um, uh, uh, book Hindutva, he says that those who do not bear cultural allegiance should be content to be deprived of all the rights, you know. So he makes equality conditional, it would seem. Uh, you know, and I think there is that subtle difference, you know. But we'll come back to that. There are many more questions. And I will come to, I saw two hands. Professor Raju raised his hand. Professor Patel raised his hand. But I have three questions from Dr. Subramanian. I will read them out. We would like to know about Savarkar, the playwright. I have read excerpts of his anachronistic play on Chokhamela. Question number one. I think we'll take it one by one. And I think we'll have some... Uh, I'm sorry to um, suggest this, Vikramji, but slightly briefer answers to take in more because I know that these are fascinating topics, but you know, around five we usually close. But go ahead. So the first question on Savarkar's playwright and the anachronistic play Chokhamela. Yeah. So uh, that's a that's going to be a, a long answer. So I'll try to keep it short. I think uh, so. One of the other facets. As a literature which we kind of don't know not only as a playwright but also as a poet uh, from the age of uh, eight and nine when he was writing in Marathi. Am I? Uh, yes, I yes, carry on, I carry on. Yeah, we can't see you but we can hear you. It says you're, uh, just a second, I'm... We're able to hear you but we can't see you. Yeah, I think you just said my network is bad. So once so as uh, you know, the different uh, literary meters of uh, you know uh, of Moropan and uh, other people of the past, the way he incorporated those into his poems, uh, uh, and these poetry is something that germinated from his childhood and it stayed on uh, in his uh, time in the jail uh, in, in London and so on. But after coming out, I mean, the the, the plays, I mean, uh, the, the whole Marathi tradition of uh, bhakas uh, and pawadas. Uh, you know, uh, uh, dating back to the uh, to the uh, times of uh, you know Shivaji and the way the uh, the, the political ballads were written, that was something he uh, attempted even in his childhood with uh, Chapekar and Chapkatka that he wrote on the Chapekar uh, brothers uh, who were his source of inspiration, uh, and that was a that was a play musical kind of a play which again was uh, you know sung and uh, played uh, right through even the 1920s. And later on, after coming to Ratnagiri, uh, he wrote several uh, plays, Singhastha Khadga, then Ushap, and uh, you know, several other uh, plays, uh, which had very difficult, including Chokhamela that uh, Subramaniam mentions, which had these very difficult kind of uh, social issues where he touched upon uh, issues like conversion, like uh, untouchability, and all of that, for which he got into trouble with the colonial government almost all the time where, uh, you know, uh, these plays itself were censored. Uh, he had to, because his uh, release was conditional and uh, on the uh, on the basis of whether it was causing uh, any kind of uh, disaffection among people. So there, was, uh, there was one thing, I think, uh, that was also the time of this Rangila Rasul, that uh, book that came out, which caused uh, a lot of, uh, you know, uh, trouble in parts of northern India, the publisher was killed and so on. So, so that time there was uh, a play that he wrote, I forget the name right now, but that again came under British uh, surveillance. And so time and time again, he was asked to explain uh, what these characters were because they were the, the spies were also going and seeing his plays uh, while they were being enacted uh, to know about the different characters, uh, what was their uh, social 
message behind it, uh, which the British probably could not understand. So uh, this uh, thing lasted uh, through the 30s, but I think after the 1930 uh, and thereafter, his uh, him as a playwright too evaporated. The poet Savarkar had uh, gone uh, gone away. So did the playwright, and later it just became a political commentator. Uh, he started writing more on contemporary issues, on politics, on bhasha shuddhi. Uh, which became a very important uh, aspect of his uh, you know, contribution to Marathi literature itself, where having the Devanagari script uh, and also having uh, terms which are uh, not drawn from Urdu and Persian, uh, which were being subsumed, uh, you know. So many of these terms which we have, Dur Darshan, uh, Dig Darshak uh, for a, a director and a producer, these kind of terms that we have, we don't even, uh, Dur Bhash, uh, for a telephone and so on. So these type of terms were actually coined by him in an entire glossary of Bhasha Shuddhi Karan uh, to create new Indic, uh, you know, terms, uh, Indian terms, which are not dependent on, uh, you know, uh, Farsi or Arabic or Urdu, which was what was commonly the the uh, the, the norm then. Where even Punjabi, etc., Sindhi, Punjabi, though the language was spoken uh, in that language, the script was usually the Persian script. So uh, it also meant a death of your own languages. And so, uh, you know, again, we get back to getting that pride in our own uh, language and so on. So that was again one of his contributions. Oh, thank you. Uh, the next question again from Subhu. The problem is that Ambedkar too was very categorical that Hinduism divides society within and destroys the possibility of building a nation. I'm not sure if your interpretation of Punya Bhumi is borne out by the text of Savarkar's Essentials. Uh, so, so this is a question or comment? Yeah, it's a comment. I, I guess he's trying to say that uh, uh, not just Islam divides, as Ambedkar uh, said in the quotation that you read out between believers and non-believers and Darul Harb and Darul Islam. I think the implication of the question or the comment is that, according to Ambedkar, Hinduism also divides and you cannot therefore build a Hindu Rashtra because, you know, it, Hinduism is equal to caste or something. I mean, I'm interpreting, but... Yeah, I guess yeah. I mean, that's, that's put perfectly. I mean, these were all political thinkers of their time and each one is, uh, I mean, legitimately have their uh, have their viewpoints and uh, in retrospect, I think we can just kind of comparatively assess and see all of them and uh, what has actually uh, worked out is what we are able to see now and their quotations are only for retrospective. I quoted that particular aspect only because the issue that uh, uh, was brought up that uh, there was an equivalence that was made between Jinnah and uh, Sabakar. In the same, uh, in fact, in the same paragraph, uh, as a continuation of that is where Ambedkar talks about uh, Islam, but whether whether the, the Hinduism may be, a, 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 according to Ambedkar, I, I'm not sure, I've not read all of his writings, whether he has actually said it's a divisive religion, it divides people, but does it divide so irrevocably that the people can't even live together? Uh, does it need, uh, the, uh, does, does he prescribe a cutting up of Hindu, uh, the Hindu Rashtra, so to say, into a Maharistan, uh, uh, Chamaristan, uh, Brahministan? Does he say that? I'm not sure of that. Uh, whether despite the differences, uh, we can all live together is what he propagates. Whereas according to him, in this particular case, this being a civilizational battle and a, uh, a complete antithesis of each other, he feels that they cannot even come under the same uh, roof because there are theological, uh, you know, opposition to it. So those things, I think that becomes an interpretation of Ambedkar's uh, writings, which uh, is a different topic altogether. Well said. I think that's fair enough. Your writing on Savarkar, not Ambedkar. So, uh, uh, Dr. Raju. Well, I think uh, I find your explanation not at all convincing that the British were suspicious. They can remain suspicious even if they have somebody working for them. If you don't trust a person, you work together. So mere suspicion is no proof that uh, you know he was against the British. He did not utter a word against the British after he was released. 
the simple fact. I think we have to acknowledge that fact. You are talking about acknowledging scars. On the contrary, as you correctly mentioned, there was the Khilafat movement at that time. And there was nothing to counter that movement. And he became the counter to that movement. Because at that point of time, Congress had gone out of the control of the British. It is true that the British started the Congress, but uh, by the 1920s, it was totally out of their control. Right? So they had to have something. What was that thing? So I think you are not painting a fair picture from that point of view. He did do something. He never spoke of, I mean, independence from the British. Right? But he did speak against what was happening. And he did speak against the Khilafat movement. He did speak against Jinnah. He was not the counterpart of Jinnah. So he was not asking for partition. He was asking that everybody, the bank should be one and the Muslims should be somehow subordinate to it. So he was asking for that. He was not the counterpart. But he was with the British. How do you get him out of that? I don't see that. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I mean, it's, it's, it's again a, a, a question of uh, interpretation because if you actually see all his speeches, uh, of course, the bulk of the, uh, uh, the, the, the time when one needs to see when he actually did speak for or against anybody is after 1937 when he actually came into active politics because before that he was not even allowed to utter anything uh, political. So the, the social work was uh, the, the front end uh, for whatever else was happening. Uh, you know, uh, behind it. But from 1937 to 44, all the the, 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 the speeches of the Hindu Mahasabha, uh, uh, as the president of the Hindu Mahasabha, bulk of uh, it was, of course, criticizing the Congress as the main political opponent. That was also the time by when uh, elections and political uh, electoral politics had kicked in. So uh, there was a political opponent uh, in elections who had to be addressed. But uh, never has uh, in those speeches uh, the, the contention being that we need to continue to be a part of, I mean, the British needs to be a part, I mean, uh, ruling this country is always asked for uh, a complete independence uh, for the country. Uh, and this whole idea that he was also looking for militarization and support, uh, supporting the British war efforts uh, in World War II, which is also held as one of the proof of uh, collaboration is, uh, as I mentioned earlier, by that time, the fact that the British were going to leave India was quite uh, almost a given. It was not, I mean, uh, the, the two, three months of the Quit India movement was all the mass movement that was happening. But otherwise, even the Congress was sitting across the table and it was only negotiations and concessions and uh, working out the details of the transfer of power. There was really no anti-British uh, uh, movement uh, to say that was going on. So. Yes. I think you are tackling cliches. I am raising a different point. Right? So uh, you are not answering that point. Why did the British show clemency to Savarkar? They were not, they were extremely brutal people. So there was a deal. And that deal you have to get into. You are not getting into that. And he never actually spoke against the British. Okay, you can say he could not because he was released as a political prisoner. But he was doing something which helped them. By dividing. Can I just step in here? I think I think that uh, I think Professor Raju has an important point. The point is that many people made many kinds of deals with the British. What about M. N. Roy? Some say that Dr. Ambedkar made a deal with the British. He never criticized the British either. In fact, uh, he appealed to them to intervene on behalf of the depressed classes. So. In the and where did the Muslim League criticize the British? So it was see. So if you look at the configuration of uh, uh, Indian nationalism and its satellite subnationalisms and so on and so forth, you see a very complicated and multi-layered engagement with British imperialism. And the British were trying to get all kinds of people, especially those who didn't like Gandhi, to make deals with them. Right. So. Now, uh, that doesn't prove anything. My point is that these so-called collaborators were also in their own ways anti-imperialists at, at a particular level. So you had a frontal attack on British imperialism by the Congress and all the others were trying to use the imperialistic situation to their advantage in getting the maximum benefits in the post-independence dispensation. So I think Hindu Mahasabha was also trying that 
So it was Muslim League who, who basically wanted partition, which they got, and so forth. But can we move on? Because we have to end soon. And uh, uh, I'm, I'm sure I will leave it to uh, Vikramji to give his last words at the end. But I want to take one question from Professor Patel, who has been very patiently waiting. Thank you, sir. Aap, bari, puchye sawal aapka. Uh, sir, I, I wanted to uh, begin with uh, this that I liked uh, this book on Savarkar, particularly the Kalapani phase. Wonderful, is it? And, uh, and, and uh, what I liked about it is that you, you are not trying to uh, see it ideologically. Uh, you are seeing uh, Savarkar as a man who was a revolutionary and who was caught in a situation where he didn't know what will happen tomorrow. So that kind of situation, uh, and there was there are evidences, and you handled it that well, very well. I mean, I should I should say that uh, even if a historian would not be very very satisfied with your work, if if he he wants to see. Uh, Savarkar and his time gets reflected in your work because there are some issues which I would I would like to bring into your notice because those things are uh, can be useful for you when when you deal with post 1926 uh, situation which Professor Paranjpe has rightly pointed out. Uh, it's a very complicated situation where <clears throat> the negotiators are actually negotiating uh, to serve their own interests. I mean they are not uttering any word against British, still they are doing things which were, they, they found that they, those could be useful. That is a very significant point. And very often people miss that. And therefore we have a very partisan kind of history, history writing about, uh, about the period post Khilafat. And therefore this, this problem comes in. And, and, and as because he has raised, I mean Roy's name, uh, uh, he has Included Emin Roy into it, I think, and I have been saying for. I could, I could include. I could include Dange, Shripa no, Dange, yeah. who made a deal with the British. Yeah, yeah. get out of I, 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 I just wanted to uh, emphasize what I have been saying for quite some time, that history writing has has to include, has to admit that at least there were three, uh, three significant axis along which uh, a history, um, an independence movement history can be written. One obviously uh, Gandhian, Gandhian trope or whatever you call it. Another was uh, Savarkar and Amin Roy. These are these three axes have to be have to be kept in mind when we talk about post 19, I mean post Khilafat period um, historical uh, situation. And I'm bringing this uh, because this is a completely different situation in which Savarkar is criticizing Gandhi's Khilafat experiment very differently. I mean, Roy is, is uh, criticizing very differently and still Gandhi manages to come out with his support based intact in spite of all his failures. And you have actually uh, brought in this question when you talked about 37 to 44 phase, when you say that Gandhi Gandhi could manage to get the support and Savarkar failed in that. So these are the questions which actually will haunt history uh, historians uh, this time onwards, I believe. So history has to be written very differently from this point. I mean, this is absolutely a very different kind of situation in which history is to be taken up. This is the thing which I wanted to uh, wanted to share with you, but I have a specific question also, and that question is is uh, related to um, your Savarkar's dealing with or association with uh, late nineteenth century um, R.S. Samaj uh, connection. I mean, I mean, let me put it this way. Uh, you have said that Savarkar was enthusiastically supporting the idea that Hindi should be the national language in a way. I mean, he was trying to, this is, you have traced it from 1906, and that is very important. 
at around that time he was one of those people who were able to understand that uh, uh, Dhanan Saraswati's making Hindi very important was a crucial factor in the nation building. At that time there was no Gandhi as such. So even then Savarkar is making Hindi the language of the nation in a way, the language which will, uh, which will, which will bring entire in India into uh, into one kind of connection, linguistic connection, so to say. So that is where I felt that your book could have engaged with some other connections with late 19th century uh, developments. And this is one of the things where I think even revolutionaries connections with each other. You brought in that point in your discussion that even in those days where there was no WhatsApp group and all that, these revolutionaries were connecting with each other. And we have those kind of connections. Definitely, because, because, because materials are available, but in different languages. So you, you can find materials on Bhai Parmanand in, in, in Punjab, but not in Hindi or English. Maybe about Bhagajati in, in Bengali or, or, or other, uh, other uh, except that the Trish Banerjee's work has come in. Otherwise, th these, these connections are to be understood with some other kind of evidences which are not available in English or in archival material. And that is where I think your book uh, actually leaves a scope for us, for many others, to work on further in order to get a kind of all India perspective of how revolutionaries actually tried to build up a national base. And they had, and those connections may have, may give us a different perspective of post 1914 uh, developments. Recently, some materials have come up and, 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 and I think those uh, efforts to bring army into it, which was very crucial to Savarkar's project of bringing army into it, is something which has to be looked into uh, in, 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 a continued, in, a, in a process which actually started much earlier. And there was a continuity in that. Even during 1942, we find uh, some efforts to bring army into it. So these are the things which I thought that uh, these could be brought into your attention so that you may have uh, you may look into those directions uh, because whether you like it or not, people would try to bring uh, the time into that uh, that uh, that uh, discussion, and therefore you will always be talk um, interested in talking about Savarkar and his failure, and people would be uh, pulling you towards that kind of situation where you will have to say whether. Savarkar was a traitor or not, or he was a man who was actually uh, a man who was a different. I mean, this is these are things. Last but not least, I'm 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 dragging this point because I am not able to frame that what I say uh, why I wanted to say that well. But uh, last but not the least, <clears throat> and this problem uh, remains a big problem for anybody who takes Savarkar's case. Savarkar comes out comes from Andaman to realize that a greater danger has come up. Till then, British were the biggest problem. Now he says it is the, it is the Muslim, so, Muslim uh, challenge. And therefore, this, 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 this conflict in him, the revolutionary past, somebody who has written 1857 history in a very, very, in a quote unquote, secular manner, that now is saying things in a manner which is hardly, uh, which could be linked with the earlier period. So there are two Savarkar at, at that. And third, and, and this is where I think I, I go with you, his political failure, 1937 to 44. I have read his speeches very carefully. And I found that he was saying something which was, it was not possible for people to understand 
how he was inviting uh, uh, Nepal's uh, contribution to it into a net. And you must have seen Bhagalpur Ka Morcha, Rishab Charan Jain's book and all. I have gone through all those things. And I found that Savarkar was unable to even convince uh, uh, um, Mukherjee, Bhai Parmanans, from Bhai Parmanan to Savarkar, and then Mukherjee comes. So we have a lot of problems uh, uh, we, uh, for, for Savarkar's study. I am I'm, I'm hopeful that many more works on Savarkar would come up and possibly he would be he would be given a fair trial and therefore I think your work has done a great service to us although I, I, I think a historian uh, maybe not be satisfied with that but at least you have given us uh, uh, an account of Savarkar uh, which uh, gives us a scope that uh, Savarkar can can be seen very differently from what we have seen so far. And I, I really enjoyed reading your book. Look forward thank you. to the second. Thank you. Thank, you. thank you, Professor Patel, for that uh, fairly lengthy but very thoughtful intervention. I'll just turn it over to you, Vikramji, for your closing comments. But I was struck by two things. First of all, I just wanted to say, in defense of all biographers, not just Vikramji, that the historian's task is different from a biographer's. So whether or not a historian finds a particular biography useful in the manner in which they expect it to contribute to a better picture of that particular period or not, valid though it may be, I think a biographer's dharma is slightly different. Now, what is the link between history and biography? That's a huge, huge subject and very fascinating. But I do, I do want to say one or two things. I agree with... Uh, Professor Patel about an important point, which is the political failure of Savarkar and his Hindu Mahasabha. See, Hindu Mahasabha never quite took off, you know, and it never had the appeal uh, that a major political party needs to have. And what are the reasons for it? I think this, is it the personality of Savarkar, which was not as charismatic, but he was also charismatic, by the way, because people went to the gallows for Savarkar. So he had a magic of a different kind. But something to think about. Even Shama Prasad Mukherjee had to join the Janasang. So it's the rejig of the uh, foundational ideas of the Hindu Mahasabha transformed through the Sang, actually. Because if you really go into the genesis of the Janasang, it's actually Guruji, uh, you know, Golwalkar, who actually was the brain behind it, you know. And even that didn't take off. It was only in uh, 2.0, post-emergency, that uh, they had to, they were forced to go alone because of this bogus, whatever, uh, you know, I would call it bogus, but this, I would not call it, maybe bogey of dual membership on which Raj Narayan and others attacked them. And then they had to say, look, we have to be on our own. Then BJP was born, etc. So. I think the political uh, sort of transformation of Savarkarite ideas has to be seen in that light. And finally, what you said very rightly, I will take it even further back. You see, let's go back to the Great Revolt of 1857. And I think Savarkar, when he called it the First India War of Independence, he realized that if you could provoke the sepoys, call them sepoys, from that time or this time, you know, Pasa Palar Jayaga, British Samrajya Ka Pasa Palar Jayaga. So, uh, you know, Sanjeev Sanyal gave an extremely interesting talk here, where he tried to link all the revolutionaries, as you tried today, you added to it, that it was an all India thing during the incarceration of the revolutionaries and Andamans, they were trying, post that they were trying, you know, they wanted an all India revolutionary formation, not just all India, the Ghadar uh, party in California and elsewhere, Canada, it was an international movement, okay? And it was beyond left and right. I think all kinds of people came together. So I think the key for them, right up to Sebastian de Bose, is somehow to get the Indian army to revolt against the British, which somehow never happened. Because let's let's go to China, let's go to Korea, None of them ever served the imperial masters, never. 
ever. You could never recruit Chinese to fight uh, for the Japanese. They had to fly in uh, or uh, ship in Indians to police Hong Kong and Singapore. So there is something about the Indian mentality, it would seem, which can be divided and ruled much easier than, you know, maybe other Asians. You couldn't recruit the Thai to fight against the Thai, etc., King and so forth. So this is a different matter. But I think the key was the Great Revolt and all the revolutionaries felt that if somehow you could get the Indian soldiers to revolt against the British, you know, British imperialism would go up in a puff of smoke. That never happened. The British were good paymasters and they still give their pensions to the Gurkhas. And, you know, after the First World War, they recruited so many soldiers from Punjab and all were pensioned, etc. But that's a different matter. We've exceeded our time. I turn it over to Vikramji. Thank you once again for joining us. Please do visit, you know, post-COVID, post-vaccine, pre-vaccine. We'll give you a safe environment. Come and write portions of your second volume here. You're most welcome. And you'll find a fellowship amongst uh, our residents here, which is not easy to get usually. Whatever our views, I think we are all passionately committed to the life of the mind. So go ahead and thank you so much on behalf of the extended IS family. Thank you for this wonderful presentation. And we wish you, what should I say? More power to your pen and uh, less or no writer's blocks in the months to come. Go ahead, you have the last word. Thank you so much, Makranji, and thank you so much, uh, Professor Patel. I think that was a very, very enlightening uh, comment and some very, uh, very pertinent points for me to reflect uh, on as well, uh, particularly the whole language issue. Uh, to be uh, quite honest, I uh, in the first volume, I hadn't actually uh, you know, thought of it uh, through that angle. But though uh, in the second volume, while, I'm, while I was going through this whole, his whole journey of uh, Bhasha Sudhi uh, that he was doing, uh, there I did uh, kind of get into a little foray into what, where does this whole linguistic, uh, you know, purity, the the one language, one nation, one god, one um, this unitariness uh, that uh, the Hindu right uh, often gets accused of. Uh, is it just uh, is it just political unitariness that was being talked about, or was it cultural uh, unitariness? And in, in which case, how does that? sit uh, you know in consonance with a multi-racial multi-religious country like india or is, are those the friction points those are things that i've tried in a little bit to investigate uh, with the limitations of what a biography writing uh, can offer but thank you very much for those uh, valid points and thank you so much makranji for summing up this uh, this whole thing as beautifully as only you can uh, and I think the uh, the pertinent thing is, yeah, Savarkar will continue to raise heckles. There are going to be extreme opinions. Uh, but I think what is important now is at least this window of discussion uh, on various aspects of his life. Have, at least that has begun. And uh, his, the very fact that somebody is brought out of this, uh, the confines of uh, political and academic untouchability, uh, and open for assessment, somebody whose uh, views, whose philosophy uh, has been important enough to capture, maybe in his time, it was, uh, you know, uh, he was not able to, uh, you know, galvanize masses, but some version 2.0, 3.0 of that uh, has attracted a large uh, section of the country today in political ascendancy in some way. Uh, and you mentioned uh, Guru Golwalkar and him. So that also, I mean, there's, there's an entire part of this uh, volume two where I, uh, you know, trace the very stormy relationship that he shared with the RSS, particularly after uh, Dr. Hedgevar's death, uh, where, you know, he comes up with this uh, outlandish and, uh, you know, the, as only he could, you know, crass and uh, brusque kind of a thing where he says, there's only one achievement on the epitaph of an RSS worker would have only three lines. He was born, he joined the RSS, he died. There's no other achievement in his life. And so, you know, that was the kind of, uh, I mean, today we, we would uh, paint Hindutva in one brush, RSS synonymous with Savarkar, synonymous with Godse, synonymous with everything. Uh, whereas I think those nuances uh, where uh, you could see that there was numerous these uh, these differences where people did not see eye to eye. And they, those also account for his, uh, you know, leadership failure where you're not even able to consolidate people of your own, uh, you know, uh, ideology so, uh, and thought process into a common front, especially when you're 
time and time again talking about this common enemy who's trying to vivisect this country. So a lot of grandiose statements that it will happen, it, we will never let it happen. We will do this, we will do that, but not even a direct action that was uh, promised. So a lot of these things, uh, which, you know, in retrospect, uh, he does uh, come up as the typical, uh, you know, the tragic uh, hero uh, of a Shakespearean novel. Uh, where ultimately it leads to uh, leads to uh, the kind of position that he is in history today. But I think a discussion on all of this, a dispassionate discussion on all of this, I think that those vistas uh, being opened, I think that is what is more important. And uh, thank you and IIS and the entire uh, you know uh, fraternity there for giving me this chance to share my work with all of you. So it's very very engaging discussion with you all. Thank you. Thank you, Vikram ji. Bye. Thank Bye. You. See you. See you soon. Hopefully. See you Bye. Soon.